Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy, with one of our favorite guests, Dr. James Baker. Dr. Baker, of course, is a physician, a researcher, and an immunologist with Michigan Medicine uh, here in the great city of Ann Arbor with the University of Michigan. Um, I want to say that Dr. Baker is not only one of our most popular guests, but indeed kind of a surprise guest today that you're <laughs> back again. How are you? Yes, we thought we'd be done with this indeed. by now. Yeah, well, uh, COVID just seems to be that story that, that keeps giving, and uh, there's a new uh, phenomena happening today, and I think that there's nobody better qualified to uh, speak about this. And for my listeners and viewers and readers, uh, please go and listen to our prior episodes with Dr. Baker. Um, his prognostications were far more accurate than anything. Um, he is, in my opinion, the most learned person um, about the uh, virus, about the disease, how it spread, how the vaccines work. Um, and it's really great grounding uh, with, without a political agenda at all. Um, and today we're gonna go into where we stand today and um, some unusual happenings. Is it a, am I using the correct term if I say a bio lab in Boston? Yeah, yeah. You know, first off, I think I think we've all learned a lot about this going forward. And you know, the amazing thing to me is that we don't really have a way forward. You know, it's been announced that the pandemic is over. You know, we can argue about the technicality of that. Uh, decision or that that statement, but I think the real problem here are these large problems of where are we going with this right now, and all the noise that's generated around this. And the bio lab issue, I think, is an important one. Well, I, that that way forward, I agree because um, you know we recently had it announced that uh, perhaps they need to vaccinate children and. Um, from my lay perspective, uh, I don't see a case for that. So few children were infected. So few of the deaths uh, uh, affected children, yet we have this prevalence now, particularly in adolescent males uh, with uh, myocardial issues and with uh, young women with uh, interruptions in the menstrual cycle. It seems to me that the risk-reward balance or the calculations changed. So, so that's a very good question. And I think there, there are a number of levels that we have to look at that. And the first is, what is our overall goal for controlling this disease going forward? Mm -hmm. And uh, quite honestly, we have not heard that. We've not heard a plan from the CDC about going forward. How do we anticipate we're going to control this and yet make sure that all of the people are healthy and taken care of? And you know, the vaccines and the drugs have use in this, but until we know the overall plan, I can't tell what the benefit is to young people. The good news is that the risk is very low. And if you look at the risk of the vaccines for myocarditis and menstrual disruption and other issues, it's less than the risk of the infection. But at this point, what are we achieving with vaccination? And that's what we need to understand. And the CDC hasn't enunciated that for us. So, you know, if I don't know as a physician and investigator, how does the common man understand what the risk reward benefit is and make that decision for their child? Well, precisely. And in my uh, readings and in keeping up with the, with the issue, the conversation turn from what do we do about public health? How do we keep people healthy to, well, we just need to vaccinate everybody. The objective is not vaccination. The objective is to control the disease. Um, and uh, in sp uh, springtime, I 
heard uh, Dr. Fauci on w with Wolf Blitzer, um, and he said, well, we're going to get, you know, five to 12 year olds before uh, the, the spring, and then, uh, you know, by the first of the year, first of 2022, uh, we want to have it for infants being discharged from the hospital. Never said anything about the disease or the risk. It was just, we're going to vaccinate everybody. And it just didn't make any sense to me about uh, accomplishing an objective, as you stated. And the reason it doesn't make sense to you is that there's no goal associated with that vaccination. You know, I think what we've learned is that by getting at least the initial series of vaccines, which I now include a third, you know, six months later as, as part of that initial thing, not a booster itself. Uh, I think we learned that we could protect most people from serious disease and death. Even older people, it's been very effective for that. But what are we now accomplishing by these rounds of reimmunization? What do the new boosters accomplish? People talk about antibody titers to neutralize new viruses. But in fact, if you look at each of these rounds of infection, they become less and less. And that's a typical thing with pandemics and epidemics. The virus mutates to become less deadly because it has to propagate itself and people develop immunity that protects them. And in fact, the most effective immunity we're seeing right now is the combination of the virus and infection. Uh, the vaccine and infection. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. combination yields very good protection for a long term with people. Uh, and the vaccine itself, um, you know, we're always guessing too. And, and I'm very concerned that they've not stated any interval they're going to do these boosters. They're talking about changing them every time a new variant comes out. Well, that's happening every three or four months. And immunizing somebody every three or four months doesn't make sense immunologically, let alone in terms of public policy. So I, I, I really appreciate the way you talk about how the uh, virus and the pandemic mutates, that the virus becomes less deadly over time. And at the same time, I read claims that the vaccines limit the severity of illness is there any data that says that the severity of illness is reduced because of the vaccine or it's just getting weaker and the vaccine took out people that were more susceptible? And even Dr. Fauci, and I don't like to keep bringing him up, uh, but he admitted, well, the vaccines really aren't that good at stopping infection, uh, but perhaps they were limiting severity. Yeah. Do we have any data that tells us that or how can you tell? We do have data. And what they did for each virus variant, for each wave, they looked at people who were unvaccinated and vaccinated. And the ones that were unvaccinated have much higher rates of severe illness and death. Mm -hmm. So in fact, relatively speaking, the vaccines have helped a lot, but there's also a natural evolution of this whole process. And I think at this point, we need to start looking at what the viruses are out there and not just saying, oh, I'm worried that a new variant will come up that's really bad. You know, if there is a new variant that the vaccines don't protect against and is really bad, that's a totally different equation than what we're seeing now. And it's nothing that we really would anticipate from what we've seen with the virus so far. And I've, I've heard from a number of people, and these are lay people, by the way, uh, that say, look, if I take the vac my next vaccine, my next booster, I I'm going to be sick for a day and a half. And if I get the current uh, version of, of COVID, I'm going to be sick for a day and a half. So what's the point? You know, I think, I think there are a couple of points. And, and these are points that are not being laid out for us. When you're sick with COVID, you are contagious. So in fact, you serve as a vector to infect other people. And I think if we were 100% vaccinated and had been 100% infected, then I think the risk would be fairly small, but we aren't. There's still unvaccinated pops and populations. And in many elderly people, or in immunosuppressed people, they are at risk. Well, I, I, my understanding though, the vaccine didn't stop the transmission. If, if 
if uh, a person was vaccinated yet got a case of COVID, they would have less severe illness, but they'd still be able to transmit. Am I wrong about that? Well, there's there's a less likelihood. You aren't wrong. It doesn't stop transmission completely, but it reduces the likelihood of transmission. And it reduces, more importantly, the likelihood of infection. Now that, as you point out, has been much less than it did initially. And I think yeah, probably the worst case scenario is Dr. Walensky, who got the brand new booster and a month later when her immunity should be the greatest, got infected. And that doesn't mean that the booster didn't work. In fact, it meant that the virus mutated again and, and she was protected against what was there in June, but not what was there in October. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, she didn't get ill, um, you know, and, and this is the real issue. Why are we immunizing people? We're immunizing people to protect them, to prevent spread to other people, to try and reduce the burden on businesses, on, you know, all kinds of activities, workplaces, schools, you know, I don't think there's data that really supports we're doing any of that right now. And I would love to hear from the CDC what their over plan, overall plan is moving forward. Are we going to continue trying to immunize every time we see a new virus out there? Or are we at some point going to say, most of the population is protected, people aren't getting sick from this, people aren't really dying from this unless there's a high risk in them? And in that case, the, the vaccine probably won't work as well. So, you know, I think we need to really define what this is and how it fits in. I think the same thing's true for the antiviral drugs. I mean, they're now effective, especially in elderly people or people that have some type of uh, health problem. But you know, the data doesn't show that they're helping at all in younger people or even in vaccinated people. Is that people. right? Yeah. I, I remember on, when you were on the show earlier, um, you, you talked about the need, if you are infected, to intervene with the antivirals. And my lay understanding was eventually, if you don't interrupt that, your body becomes a viral virus processing right. factory. Right and you can't catch up with it and then you can be in real deep trouble. Right, if your immune system doesn't work right. But those studies were done in unvaccinated people where they showed a 95% reduction. When they went into young, healthy, vaccinated people, they saw no difference from the antiviral drugs. Is that right? Yes. So if I'm a 35 year old, no, no existing uh, health conditions and I've been vaccinated and I get a uh, infection, the Paxlovid and the other antivirals aren't going to work. For Probably you. aren't going to give you much benefit. Just going to ride that out. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned workplaces. And now we, we all know stories of people that were fired indiscriminately because they didn't want to take what was then an experimental right. vaccine. Um, we now see uh, reversals, particularly in public sector employees, saying you can't keep us out of work and seeing a lot of those uh, policies reversed. Um, a lot of people were really harmed by this, put out of work, uh, basically for making a personal medical decision. Not to mention the school issue. Oh, the schools are are uh, among uh, the worst. And but let's look at the workplace. Right, we, we're not dealing with children. Um, it, it, did it ever make sense to fire everybody that didn't get a vaccine? Yeah, I think there should have been positive reinforcement for people to get vaccines, trying to educate people and explaining to them it was for their own good, especially initially. That first wave of virus took a lot of people out. It was a severe illness, especially if you had no immunity. So that initial vaccination really changed the table for everyone. And, and we could argue at that point, especially with adults where we had lots of data that it was something that, that should have been encouraged for everyone. I think, I think forcing people, you know, to do something that was not in, you know, that, that was in the public good and in their personal good, if they were refusing to do it, I don't think helped, you know, and it hardened resistance for people. And I think it, it 
was a demonstration about how ineffective our communications, our public health system was in encouraging people to do something that would help them. At this point, we're seeing sort of a, a redo of that. And we're just talking about, as you point out, vaccinating people without making the argument what the vaccinations are going to achieve and without providing data for that. Yeah, but just by saying you get more antibody doesn't mean that you're going to be protected from being infected. And I think they admit that now. If you're in a high risk group, you have to do this and you have to keep immunizing yourself because you're at risk for mm -hmm. death still. But if you aren't, we need to make some type of statement about what would be reasonable for people. Right, personal medical decision. Absolutely. R risk reward. Um, if a person is you know, elderly, got asthma, they were a former smoker, obese, you might want to think about keeping your boosters going because you're, you're at risk. If you've got a robust immune system, uh, no, none of those other uh, issues that would amplify the, the disease, you're probably okay and should be left alone. Um, because we've seen some really extreme things. Look, we had uh, governments mandating vaccine passports. Um, uh, we have a theater in town here that um, probably is on the verge of bankrupting itself because they went that direction. And they're still, the best of my knowledge, and we're recording this um, on November 4th, still requiring masks indoors. Of course, this is in Ann Arbor where I did see a guy driving in a BMW convertible with the top down uh, by himself wearing an N95 mask. So, and I think it slipped off. That, so I think that he was, was for aesthetics though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't grow a beard or something. So put that on. <laughs> right. I don't know. Uh, but it's more fashionable in Ann Arbor. Oh, if indeed. You're driving in your convertible with a mask. Than it, indeed. Yes. Uh, so we got into that um, not dealing with facts, not dealing with the notion that there are personal choices, but. Um, we're going to wear the bat mask as a as a badge, um, but but to, to, let's to talk about ma uh, masks. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the common cold and flus were severely reduced by use of masks. And I Absolutely. believe, Absolutely. yeah, and we we know that. And, and and as a guy that used to fly a lot for work, like I wish we would have had like a culture that said let's put on masks before we fly. Uh, because Lord knows how much stuff you're exposed to. Um, so you'd think that could be a discovery that when we get to cold and flu season and you're traveling in crowded places, maybe it's a good idea to have a mask on. Well, exactly. Right now, the flu is a big issue. Flu season started early, probably because we were protected for two years and people were so focused on COVID, they weren't getting their flu shots. I've been telling all of my patients who are at risk Get the flu shot first, you know, get it right now because that's out there. The, the incidence of these infections is very important in this. If you have a high incidence of infection, if we have another outbreak where we're seeing 10 or 15% of the non-symptomatic um, population coming up for virus, then it makes sense to wear a mask uh, over COVID. We're already seeing those levels in parts of the U.S. with influenza. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we didn't learn that with respiratory disease, for true outbreaks, this makes sense, is really disappointing. And I think some of that is that they, start, they, they initially told people not to wear masks, which was really the only effective thing, washing your hands with Lysol, all this stuff was crazy. The, the thing now is that during outbreaks, masks are effective, but they kept them on so long, people have become resistant. And, you know, again, we've had a failure of public health to really explain the value of these interventions and use them appropriately. You know, they've become, they've become more issues than they've become really public health means. Right, and I think part of that, people were looking for absolutes. Yes. Um, just like we are in this political environment that seems binary, which is really unusual, um, given the diversity of opinion and, and, and overlaps if you Venn diagram things. Uh, but people were looking for absolutes. And, you know, when they found masking in schools, I don't believe that there's any evidence at all that 
of masking in schools had any positive effect at all? The data is very controversial <clears throat> and not at all in one direction. So, uh, you know, I think, I think, again, you know, the schools were a, a big mistake. And even the most potent, you know, shutdown people, Randy Weingarten, mm -hmm. are now saying, yes, it was a mistake. You know, forgive us. Well, I mean, forgiveness is not the problem. It's what we do going forward and making sure we don't make these mistakes again. We, we do need to revisit the policies. Yes. Um, and when you think some of the crazy things that happened in our home state here of Michigan, uh, where certain aisles and stores were taped off. You know, you, you could go and buy a can of tomatoes, but you couldn't go buy tomato seeds to put your garden in. Right. That kind of thing. Um, it, it made no sense uh, to, to do that. So, um, you know, as we were talking about schools and kids in schools, uh, the vaccinations for children, uh, likely not a great uh, risk-reward profile, given that we don't know what the objectives are. Um, hopefully, but does adding the vaccine to the childhood schedule, does that give the manufacturers any protection at all? Are there other non-clinical reasons why that vaccine would be on that schedule? Um, I can't answer that. I don't think it does. I mean, one of the interesting things is the original vaccine is now fully approved. Whereas these new boosters are again under emergency use authorization. And that does provide some protection for the manufacturers. But, you know, putting them into the standard child vaccination protocol and without even defining the frequency, you know, it's like everybody at every age gets it, the, the, the doses are a little bit different. I think this is why people like Paul Offit who is one of the leaders in pediatric vaccination, have raised issues with this. You know, we haven't defined what the benefit is. We haven't defined how we're going to use it. And rationally, how do we communicate with parents that this provides something of value to their child? None of that has been done. And I've never seen a vaccine added to the standard protocol without doing that, without providing long-term data that shows that the frequency and the type of vaccination that's being done provides true benefit to the children. And that's why people are concerned about this. And you mentioned long-term. And have we had something that in the world of immunology could be defined as long-term yet? Because these are brand new, right? Well, I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, the, the former pandemic, now non-pandemic, has evolved so rapidly, the situation keeps changing. So in fact, the risk is much lower because the frequency of infection is much lower. And many of these children have already had primary immunization mm -hmm. scheduled with this, which is the most important thing to do. So it, it's, you know, it's sort of chasing itself right now. And we really need to decide if, if we think public health wise, not politically, that the pandemic is over, how do we look at the long term now with this infection? What frequency of immunization is important? What groups should get this? You know, and what, you know, what value is it for them? And, and there has to be a value for people. You know, they don't want to expose their children to things that provide them no useful you know, protection. And I think it, it, it can be worse than that, too, because I have read from people firsthand saying, now I'm questioning all vaccines. It's like, no, we yes. don't need to bring back yes. uh, polio and whooping cough measles. and measles, diphtheria, yeah. et cetera. Um, there's no need to bring these back. But they're saying, well, you know, if, if this vaccine was kind of oversold and then people want to give it to my child, and I, I don't think that's a good thing, what am I doing with the rest of these vaccines? And I, it seems to me it'd be real easy to introduce. It, it's, it's a disaster from that perspective. You know, we really need, we need appropriate people to stand up in government, in academia, in industry, 
and give an honest perspective on this together. I think what we need to do is have a public health summit about this mm -hmm. and review what's happened, review where we've been, review our best guess about where we're going and how to deal with this medically whether it's vaccines, whether at this point it's antivirals for the people at risk. The monoclonal antibodies clearly need to be updated all the time because they're the one thing that mm -hmm. gets knocked off with the new variant. But we need to do that. And part of the reason we need to do that is your other question, which was about the bio lab. Yeah. What we're seeing now is what I will call the, the publication craze of science. Uh, you know, it used to be when you did a research study, it went through rigorous peer review where independent people looked at it and decided whether or not it made sense. If before you even did the study, your grant was reviewed to see if it made sense. And now what we're seeing is that papers get put out on the internet without any review and people do things without asking you know, the appropriate review committees, whether or not they should be doing them. And this episode with the New England highly dangerous pathogen lab, I think is, is a good example Look, what, of that. What exactly is going on? What is being built? What's its stated purpose and what are okay. the risks? So this was, this was actually something that came out of 2001 and the anthrax attacks. And we realized we really didn't have an infrastructure where people could study you know, a pathogen that was being released either as a, as a natural contagion or as a weapon. So in fact, uh, NIH funded nine centers across the country. Uh, I was actually on the review committee for this and also on the panel for the Argonne National Laboratory mm -hmm. site. Um, most of them are in lockdown places because you don't want this thing yeah. to get up. Um, there was a lot of debate about the Boston site because there wasn't a natural collection of people there that did this type of research. You know, it's more of a biotech hub. But they felt that if people were going to develop drugs and vaccines, they need a place to test them. So they built this beautiful, as you've seen in the pictures, new facility to do this work. But because there really isn't a lot of ongoing work there, it's been underutilized. And a group of uh, basically chemists thought it would be interesting to try and mix and match coronaviruses to see if they could make some of the Omicron variants more deadly. And they actually showed- You guys showed... need a hobby. Why would you want to make Omicron more deadly? Well, yeah, we already know that the primary changes in Omicron that make it less deadly are in the spike protein, mm -hmm. which is the protein that attaches the virus to mucous membranes. So, you know, that was, that's not brain surgery. That's, you know, basically why we're making vaccines of only the spike protein, because that's the difference. So what these folks did, they took the spike protein from the original virus and put in Omicron and showed that it became more like the original virus. I mean, this make, this, there was nothing to gain from this. And they put it up on a website without any review. Turns out they, they were using NIH uh, facilities, although they claim not NIH funds. So they never ask NIH or the, the bio com defense community about this. And then my favorite part is after, you know, people pointed this out and said, we don't think this is appropriate they attack the press for, you mm -hmm. know, sensationalizing this. You know, I mean, what the heck are we talking about here? You put this out for, for general distribution without any caveats suggesting that it wasn't the right thing to do or what you were going to gain out of this. And the bottom line is then you argue that the press makes something of it. NIH has stepped in, fortunately, and said that this was wrong this was wrong to do without approval in their facility, and they're going to investigate it. And I hope they look long and hard at these facilities, and some of them like this that are open in the middle of Boston, might, yeah, we might think about closing them down. Yeah, right, we're in a population center. Right. That they're making a virus that is more deadly, that we know spreads more easily. Um, 
I guess we should take some comfort. There's not a wet market there, right? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. People, people aren't buying uh, rats and bats on the on the street yeah. in Boston to eat. But most of the other sites, not surprisingly, are in national labs where you have a full protection. You know, you're away from everything. Argon has a, a fully protected perimeter. This thing's in the middle of Boston, and sure, they've got a nice fence around it. But bugs don't, you know, abide by fences. I right. mean, it just, you know, I, I was just astounded, not just by the fact they did it without much to gain, but then they attacked the press for sensationalizing. Well, it. well, the media handling of all this, and we've seen it on social media, where um, if the then current thinking about the virus was challenged, people got shut off highly regarded researchers, of course, the three people that wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, who proved themselves correct, um, they were shut down. Um, we had, uh, you know, highest levels of our government manipulating social media uh, and the, the legacy press about what was actually going on. Um, I think shutting off that debate was one of the most harmful things to public perception. I, I think people felt that if, if you know, we couldn't have rational debate among appropriate people, we'd, we'd really, you know, there was something wrong. Well, well and, and so much uh, misinformation. So there were uh, treatments, let's like the ivermectin. There was a false story that a uh, hospital in Oklahoma was being overrun by people overdosing on ivermectin. Associated Press picked it up, New York Times picked it up, it went around the world, it was, uh, people were being mocked, it never happened. Right. It, it, it's just that that event never happened. On the other hand, when we got true data that blind, you know, blind use of ivermectin, that no one, either the patient or the doctor knew where they were getting it, made no difference at all in treating mm -hmm. these people, that wasn't publicized well. And, and you know, it drove me crazy because the good data gets lost in this morass of right. noise. And you get things, you know, and, and this is not just saying people that don't have scientific credentials, it's like these guys in Boston. You know, you're doing things that don't make sense, that don't help people, that just either make them more afraid or basically make you not trust the scientific community. And that's really what's undermined everything going forward. And we need to do something to correct that. Indeed, and, and, and part of this is the origins of the virus. What do we know today, and is there a consensus about whether this was manufactured in a lab in Wuhan or somehow leapt from a, an, a was it zootonic, I think is the term? Zoonotic. It, zoonotic, thank you uh, for that, uh, where it leapt from a, uh, an animal of some type to humans. Do, is there a consensus or any ongoing investigation of that? So I think there's there's less uh, there's more agreement about the fact that this was probably not engineered, you know, whether or not it was isolated from an animal and accidentally released, uh, either from you know a, a commercial source or a laboratory, isn't clear. And obviously, very reasonable people. Uh, David Relman, people in the scientific community have raised the question that we really haven't answered the origins of this. And, and that's important not to blame people. You know, I mean, it would be good to know where this came from because if this came from a laboratory, then we need to focus on laboratory safety. If it came from a market, then we need to focus more on natural uh, exposures and evolutions. And I think, I think we may have to do both, quite honestly, but what's the relative risk? You know, if the relative risk is mainly with laboratories, we need to be much more careful in our laboratories. If the relative risk is that nature keeps throwing these things out, we need to have some sort of system that period, periodically is checking nature. You know, we've seen now people going into bat caves in different parts of the world to see what viruses are there and what the potential is. You know, it may be that we could have vaccines on the shelves waiting for some of these to come out 
because as humans get closer and closer to animals and move into animal environments, we're going to be exposed to new things. And that is the, exactly the conversation that should be in the public eye versus this, well, we're not going to talk about this because we've decided that is a forbidden theory. Um, and it, it's similarly with the, the treatments, like when the ivermectin came out, they said, oh, this is a, a horse um, medication. And it turns out, well, well, maybe there is a human dosage. Now, whether it worked or not, that should have been the discussion. Yeah. There's people have a theory that it works. Data looks at it in a blind study. Doesn't really make a difference. Case closed. Instead, it was used to excite people and you know demonize other treatments or demonize the people that thought they wanted to try this. I think you know there were lots of things at the beginning that looked like they might be helpful. You know, these transfusions from people who had been infected. Well, right, the plasma, yeah, right. The yeah. plasma exchange also failed. There, there actually, it was an interesting story, but, but the day that Henry Ford released their open label data suggesting there was benefit from ivermectin, we also had the large study in Europe, of course, where they did the double blind that showed it didn't help. And this also gives you an idea that <coughs> physicians want things to work. I mean, as mm -hmm. a physician, I want a drug to work. So in fact, if you're going to do a study, you need to do it blind and you can't let your own predisposition. Right, yeah, you can't, cannot direct the outcome. So now we've been fighting this pandemic for a period of years. Um, the President of the United States, who of course was also uh, infected, declared that the pandemic's over. Um, and you know, our president gets the best healthcare in the world, thankfully, and yet was unable to prevent an infection. We've lost a lot of people, no doubt about that. Uh, the scientific and medical community rallied. Um, it should have been a great uniter of society. It seemed to be something that's polarizing us um, even further. If you had to summarize, where are we today and where do we go forward? What things are on your mind? Yeah. You know, I mean, what's on my mind is how little we focus on the good things and how we could take them forward. You know, I think I think the vaccine development that that was sort of kickstarted by this is really remarkable. And it will have implications for many diseases, maybe even cancer. Uh, and we seem to have lost that in, in the debate about how we're using this particular vaccine at this point. Um, I think the other thing is you know, we took the worst punch that nature could give us. We lost a lot of people. It disrupted society. God help the poor young people who were out of school for a year in places like Ann Arbor. But, you know, we continue and we move forward. And the resiliency of the human race is really a remarkable thing to me. You know, people are trying to work. People are trying to get back to normal to restore society to normal. I think one of the things that Tony said early on, and, and you know, Tony Fauci is, is a friend, a hero of mine, but one of the things that bothered me the most, he said early on, I don't think things will ever return to normal again. And I think that's totally wrong. That's against human nature. That's against what we've seen. You know, the minute we got the deaths controlled, People wanted to go up. They wanted to fly. They wanted to, you know, visit places. They wanted to go to restaurants. They wanted their lives back. And we should be supporting that and, and reveling in the fact that people have been able to move on, that the science did help with this. And now where do where does it take us? Where do we go with this now? And and you know, we we've lost most of the good things that this taught us in the noise and the fighting. It, it, indeed, and, and from a political or public policy view, um, I take note that virtually no one running for office in these 2022 midterms is talking about, hey, look at the great job we did fighting COVID. And if you go back just two short years ago in the 2020 election, uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, were saying, well, first thing, we're gonna fight this virus. They're not even talking about that now. They don't want to talk about the decisions they made. Um, certain governors, like uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida, 
is saying, no, we did the right thing. We protected the vulnerable. We kept kids in school. And we think we managed that public health crisis as well as could be. We think we made more right calls, New York, Michigan, elsewhere. They didn't want to talk about it. And, you know, you mentioned out of school in Ann Arbor for a year. Um, of course, um, our governor only thought it was three months, <laughs> which <laughs> right. speaks volumes to the disconnect between science and and, well, uh, most government. of us it felt like five years yeah right? indeed and and the, you know i know how it personally affected me he said we're going to get back to normal after kind of numbing month after month i kind of forgot what normal was that's the, the real tragedy how how were we feeling and and we seemed happier uh, and now it's like we've kind of running in molasses so to speak well we need to have some type of summit and look at all the outcomes you know, Florida versus Michigan versus New York, what people did that worked, what people did that didn't work, so that the next time we don't waste our noise and our energy trying all kinds of things that made no sense. You know, I mean, it, it just, the amount of, of craziness that went on, that should go away now. We now have a modern society that's been through this we need to learn from what happened here to put best practices together for the next time. So we don't have this fighting. We don't have this argument. People know that, you know, this is going to hit us. We know we're going to take a hit with this, but we can expect within 18 months to be back. And if we just do these things, protect the vulnerable, you know, maybe not keep kids out of school, we'll do okay. And that's the real problem here. We haven't learned from this. Well, we're refusing to learn because yes. it may run against the political narrative that somebody's running. Look, I can't say that um, closing the schools was a bad idea. Because we need to I get the them. damn politics out of this. It is poisoning the discussion and it's poisoning any benefit we can reap from this. And there should in, be great benefit. I am in heated agreement with you that everything's going through a political lens instead of uh, a, a science. And then we are, well, we're going to follow the science, but never mentioning what science are you following? I'm a data guy. I'm a fact guy. I'm also willing to accept, yeah, we don't know th certain things didn't work. Um, yet we've kind of got this political expectation that there's going to be a magic bullet. And, re and remember that the one political persuasion was saying, get the vaccine, it stops the virus. The right answer would have been, we hope it stops it because that's the best thing we've got now, but we don't know. We weren't allowed to say we don't know. And uh, uh, I hope you're on everybody's short list for Surgeon General <laughs> 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 or run to the CDC because we need more common sense, but our, our political system doesn't bring our best and brightest in. We need non-political intellectual discussion about what we're going to do next time. Don't let an opportunity, don't let an experiment of nature like this go to waste. Could we, the university we lost of, too many people. Could the University of Michigan host that summit? Absolutely. We have one of the world's best public health schools. We have one of the world's best hospitals. Uh, you know, it, it would be a great place. It's a public institution. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that would be a, a great, great idea um you know if they want to hold it in washington or someplace else that's fine too but get the politics out of it you know get the public health people get the scientists the vaccinologists together mm -hmm. and plot forward you know the institute of medicine should get involved the national academy of medicine they changed the name but the national academy should get involved in doing a concise best practices learn from the pandemic so that the next time we aren't flailing at this. Well, I agree with everything except take it to Washington. Um, you know, come on here to the Midwest where we can uh, speak honestly, uh, where we're really trying to solve problems. Um, you, you know, a place to house it. If the weather was good, we'd put them in Michigan Stadium, bring in 100,000 of the best scientists <laughs> in the world for, for that. Uh, but that would be a super spreader event for truth. <laughs> I like that. In fact, there's the headline super spreader event for truth in science. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we have a new, uh,
president of the university. Yes. And uh, let's see if perhaps uh, we'll make sure that he gets a look at this and let's see if we might be able to host that. Who knows? Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed that somebody does. It. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Baker, is there anything that we haven't talked about today that you'd like the listeners and the readers and the viewers of the Common Bridge to hear or any closing remarks? It's been a, another great session. Yeah, you know, I just, I, I want to tell everyone, you know, you've done a tremendous thing. You've survived. You've done what you thought was best for your children and your families. You've restarted society in a way that, that many had predicted would never happen. And people should be proud of that. They should be proud of what we've accomplished as individuals and as society. And we should move forward with more confidence having dealt with this thing. And I hope everyone can take that message home. So clearly it's a win for the society that we're not claiming. I hope, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We focus too much on the negative. Indeed. Well, this, I again, thank you so much for your generosity of your time to be on the Common Bridge. and. I know you've been appearing on local TV with Devin Skillian on the local NBC affiliate. Um, uh, Devin does a great job with He's interviewing. Terrific. And uh, uh, you know, he started here on the Common Bridge and out to NBC. Just don't forget about the Common Bridge as you become the spokesperson <laughs> for nationally and internationally, because we sure appreciate your uh, willingness to share. Well, with, it's with great audience. having the time to get into depth on these issues with you, Rich. That, and that's what the Common Bridge is about. We're here to inform versus influence, and we, we're just very grateful for you bringing your expertise here. Great. Thank you. We've been talking today with Dr. James Baker of the University of Michigan, physician, researcher, immunologist, uh, expert in viruses, pandemics, and what we've done well, what we've not done so well, what we know, what we don't know. Um, thank you for joining us on the Common Bridge. And with our guest, Dr. James Baker, this is your host, Rich Helpy, signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.